So this is the last message in this series on cultural diversity, cultural diversity. And I've been talking to you about cultural agility, being culturally agile. Some people are so rigid in the default way of doing things because that's how they were brought up. But the key question is how now should we live? How now should we live? Yes, I was brought up this way. How much of it is based on the word and how much of it isn't? How now should I honor God in what I do? Amen? And so I've been sharing with you some differences in different cultures and I now want to do the final couple of differences. And so number 10 is egalitarian versus hierarchical. There are some cultures in this world that are very egalitarian. What do we mean by egalitarian? Everyone has a say, right? Everyone is equal. You can speak your mind. What is hierarchical? It's where you have what we call power distance, where you respect the older people, where you respect certain people, right? And if you look, you will see that this informs you concerning whether you make decisions in a consensual way or whether it's top-down decision-making, right? And you see this manifesting in the church because in some churches, it's what does the pastor say? And whatever they've said is law, you know, the law of the Medes and the Persians. You know what that was in scripture, right? You can't change that. And then people just run and they do it. And when church culture is like that, sometimes it's very easy to lead, isn't it? In this church, everyone must go to small groups. Bah! And everyone goes to small groups, okay? That's actually one of the reasons why the church in South Korea had a bit of an advantage, you know? David Yongi Cho and the guys. Because he will just say, I'm announced there's prayer meeting tomorrow, 5 a.m., prayer meeting. Whole church comes, wah, like this. Now, some of us here, when we try and suggest things, you know, it's, it's often by consensus. Like, is everyone okay with it? Are you fine, guys? <laughs> okay. Now, so you see that. So Sweden, the Netherlands, and Japan are very consensual in their approach. Very consensual in their approach. So if you're going to establish a work in Sweden, be sensitive to that. If you're going to establish business in Sweden, be sensitive to that. You know, I remember one time doing a particular workshop and I was given feedback by a guy from, I think he, he lived in the Netherlands, but he was actually a German guy. Because when I was telling them what to do in the workshop, I'd say, okay, so I want you to now do this, then I want you to now do this. And part of the feedback he gave me, because they were training us for a particular accreditation, said, you know, it was really great, Paul, it was really great, but please don't be so, um, you, you know, direct like that, saying, I want you to do this and I want you to do that. But that's normal for us here, isn't it? Okay, and people aren't offended by that. But when you go into Europe, you might have challenges with that approach. Why? It's very egalitarian, right? Um, you'll find that there are certain nations where decision-making is very top-down. Nigeria, China, India. And you see this in the church. I see it as a pastor, and I think as a pa uh, my style, I think I'm sort of in between. I don't know where you guys would rate me, you know, but I think I'm somewhere in the middle, right? But when you have the Nigerian guys, they'll be like, pastor, you tell us what we just tell us, you know, and then we'll do it. And sometimes it works well for them because they're in, they're in a lot of faith, in a lot of agreement, and they'll receive prophetic words very easily. It's like, Pastor, you declared this over my life. I took it because you had declared it, and now look, I have my miracle, right? And so it affects faith levels. But if you just think, oh, yeah, yeah, he prophesied, yeah, yeah, you know, just another person and so on, then maybe you might not experience the benefit of the breakthrough. Can you see the pros and cons with the different approaches, all right? <clears throat> Now, there's the extreme that we see with Nazi Germany. Remember the guys who'd be killing off people, and what would they say? We're just obeying orders. We're just obeying orders, right? That's an unhealthy extreme. We need to be patient when someone struggles to, to challenge authority figures simply because that's how they were raised. I coach lots of people who will say to me, hey, Paul, you know what, hey, but to, to address that with my boss, Paul, please don't say anything. What I've said to you is just between the two of us. Don't say anything. And I'm thinking to myself, this isn't even a sensitive thing. Just go and tell your boss you don't like this and this. But because of the way the person was raised culturally, they struggle to actually challenge their boss with regards to that. Amen. 
The sad thing is, if you cannot confront authority figures, if you cannot speak directly to them about certain things, then what's the alternative? Sadly, one of the alternatives is gossip. There are a lot of people who say, no, but I'm very respectful to my pastors, so I'll never address this issue. I'll never talk directly to them. But then it's nya, 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 and it causes them to sin. Amen? All right, so watch out for that if you're that type of person who cannot confront directly because of power distance. All right? Now, I still remember a particular guy in a particular organization. I won't mention its name. And he was a bit old school. And he says to me, Paul, I'm old school. I'm not like those other youngsters in my team who go and spend time with the leader. How many of you are like that? Where you end up almost offended by the fact that some people are close to a particular leader at work. Because for them, they're more egalitarian. They feel like, yes, you can be close to authority figures. But this guy was saying, but Paul, I'm old school. I struggle with that. I feel like you have to respect your boss, and that means give them space. Amen? I remember experiencing this um, some time ago in this church. When I was supposed to be part of a particular small group, I won't mention the name of the small group, and I remember there were certain people there, they were enjoying their time in that small group, and I was like, cool, I want to start attending that group. And then people were all nervous. Hey, Pastor Paul is going to be in the group. Hey, I don't think it's going to be the same. I don't think it's going to be the same. Because some of those individuals, not mentioning any names, some of those individuals came from backgrounds where if someone is an authority figure, they're there, out there. You can't be close to them. And then they were pleasantly surprised when I then joined that group. We could crack jokes with each other. They saw that I'm actually a really cool person. Amen. <laughs> right? And some of those very people are now very free, very open. They tell me everything that's going on in their lives. Right? If I give them a lift somewhere, we're driving, we're cruising, we're going to do a particular video shoot somewhere, they're very, very nice and open with me. Amen. <laughs> Praise God. Where's Sipo today? <laughs> All right. <clears throat> you'll see when he's editing this video, you'll see it. All right. Uh, I came from a background. I'm from, uh, I'm from the Eastern Highlands in Zimbabwe. Okay. And the people there are called the Manika people. There might be one or two of you here in this room, right? And uh, we are known for respecting authority, right? So we are gentlemen in that environment, right? Uh, but the thing is, there's a lot of protocol around certain activities. So for example, if I, uh, let's say my grandmother was still alive and I wanted to give her a gift, let's say it's a chicken. I can't just go and just be like, hey, Gran, here's the chicken, right? Culturally, I'm supposed to sit down and get everyone seated, right? And then I literally will say to my older brother, David, David, please can you inform grandmother that Paul has, is missing her and hasn't seen her for many days and has got this gift for her. And then David, then everything goes up the ranks, right? And then David passes it on to an older uncle and then it goes on to another older person, okay? Some of you know this. And then by the time that chicken actually ends up getting to my grandmother, the chicken is like, guys, just kill me now. <laughs> this process is taking so long, all right? And then what happens is she gets it, then there's a whole process of thanking me, right? <laughs> and, and then after we've done all of that, people are relaxed and it's all good, it's all good, and you can crack jokes and so on, right? But that's a surface feature of culture, isn't it? And it shows that there's power distance. And I remember sharing this with a particular uncle of mine who owns an IT firm. And he says to me, Paul, this manifests in business also. Because he says, what happens to me is I might be at the bottom of an elevator and the messenger sees me and he's got a package for me. But he, pass, he bypasses me. Right? And he goes to the beginning of the chain, even if that package is urgent. Goes to the beginning of the chain, and then finally it gets to me, and might be too late by the time it gets to me. Amen? So what happens is when there's power distance in a culture, it means that those with power and those without, right, there's that hierarchy in order to get to them. It also manifests in forms of worship. So I remember a particular relative of mine who was fine and comfortable with ancestral worship saying, no, 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 we believe in God. We believe in God. But, you know, we respect God so, so much. 
So we don't feel like we've got direct access to him. We, can, we have to go via, 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 via. Are you hearing me? Right? Now we know the scriptures tell us that there's only one mediator between God and man, and that is Jesus Christ. So if you go via, 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 you don't get to God, you get elsewhere. Amen? I remember speaking to a particular guy. Uh, I think he's a Zulu guy. I was coaching him recently, and he said the same thing. I said, what do you actually believe? And he says, we go to such and such a church. Our family is from such and such a congregational church. But then uh, the history, Paul, is that uh, we want to maintain our cultural traditions. So that church broke away from the missionaries from America or wherever they were from because we wanted to also do what we need to do with our ancestors. So we see that in cultures where there's power distance, often it affects the form of worship and people start doing things that are non-biblical. Are you hearing me this morning? All right. So <clears throat> we have to ask ourselves, what does the Bible actually say? What are the implications of power distance when it comes to mentorship relations? Because for some of you, you do what we call hiding from love. Hiding from love. Let me reject myself before you can reject me. So I won't ask you for mentorship because you're up there. So let me just chill with my boys. I say to some people, um, where do you see yourself in the next 10 years? And you hear them saying, you know what, in that corner office, Paul, in that corner office. They say, are you interacting with any of the people who are currently in that role? You hey, know, Paul, they're too far up there. I've got my boys. I've got my boys. You've just shown me you'll never get into that corner office. Because show me your friends, then I'll show you your future. Amen. Right? A lot of us are denying ourselves mentorship opportunities because of this thing in our culture of power distance. I cannot be intimate with authority, so I must keep my distance. I will wait for you to ask for my time before I ask for your time. If you're desperate to be mentored, don't be intimidated by anyone. You can respectfully be close to authority figures. Amen. All right? <clears throat> So, so what is power distance? What's this thing? Power distance is the extent that the less powerful accept and expect that power is distributed unequally. Power distance is the extent that the less powerful accept and expect that power is distributed unequally. How much respect or deference is shown to an authority figure? Now just think about it. How do you view people in authority? And is it how God wants you to, according to his word? Or is it based on a cultural default? And we'll look in scripture just now. In China, there's also benevolence that goes with it. So although authority is regarded very highly, authority is also very kind and loyal to followers. There's an old Chinese proverb that says, if you think you're leading people and no one is following you, you're merely taking a walk. Okay, so let's be careful. Sometimes we, we judge people very quickly and we say, oh, but that person is authoritarian. But it's, an, it's a benevolent authoritarianism. Does that make sense? They're also kind to the very people who are following them, right? There was a Danish MD. He was from Denmark, right? And now Denmark is very egalitarian. And he goes to Russia, right, as MD, but he gave the following feedback. He said, they call me president. Now, Russia is very top-down, hey? Hierarchical, right? He says, they call me president. They defer to my opinions. They are reluctant to take initiative. They keep asking for my approval, and they treat me like a king. And he struggled with that. You see, the challenge with that type of a culture is what happens when the leader is not there. People don't function. What happens when a customer comes through and says, can you just please be flexible on this particular thing? They say, no, sorry, my boss is not around. I have to wait for my boss to approve this. Have you ever been in a situation, you go to someone, they're in the front line giving you service. Oh, no, I don't have approval. I, I, can't, I see what you're saying, Paul, but I can't do it. So who's authorized to do this? Ah, uh, no, it's my, it, it's my boss. So where is she? She's on maternity Am I going to have to wait four months before this thing happens? So ask yourself, how is our culture, whether it's our national culture or our organizational culture, how is it influencing our service excellence? Are we empowering people who are dealing with customers? 
Are we just saying, I'm the boss and you cannot do anything? You cannot think. I don't pay you to think. You cannot think unless I approve of you to think. Right? How are we raising our children today? And for me, this is the challenge I face because I want my boys to grow up and to be confident with authority figures. But then where do you draw the line? Last night with one of the boys, there was a situation because they'd put out their mattresses, were watching TV, and was very, very comfortable. And they said, Mom, Dad, you can sit on the sofas, but we're going to take up the whole of the lounge with their mattresses, blankets, and everything. Right? But I found it more comfortable just joining in, like sort of in the middle section there, you know, pillows all there. Then one of my boys begins to tell me, like, you know, Dad, look, I can't use this pillow anymore because you've squashed it. It's those nice pillows, you know, that are good for the neck and so on. So if you weigh quite a bit and you sit on the pillow, it kind of like permanently squashes it, okay? So he started telling me that. Then he started saying, Dad, I don't like to fall asleep when my bed is too warm. Ask even the friends of mine at school. I don't like it. Now you've made my bed too warm. So I would like you, Dad, please, like, can you now move away? So I started saying to him, do you pay rent to live here? I started saying to him, do you know that if I wanted, I could make you sleep in the kitchen? Because for me, there was a genuine conflict. Like I was thinking, I'd never say that to my dad when I was growing up. And this particular son of mine, like he's very egalitarian in how he sees things. So my wife was dishing up supper for us last night. And so this, this particular boy then said like, uh, can I first serve? Can I first serve? And my wife says, no, uh, dad is going to have first serve. And for him, it became a debate. Like, mom, like, why, why, does, why is it that dad has to have first serve? The other two kids, like, I could understand. But this one was like, what? what? And, she, and I could see my wife was now thinking on her feet. She was like, because I think that's the honor that he's due. That's why we're giving him first serve. All right? So this is what we go through on a day-to-day -day basis. If you're a nation, if you're in a nation that values hierarchy, but you, but you don't, then how will they see you? If you're in a nation that values hierarchy, but you don't really value it, you're quite relaxed about these things, my question to you is, how will they see you? Sometimes they end up seeing you as a weak leader. Sometimes they can see you as indecisive. And this is something we need to manage and to say how then shall we live sometimes they might think this guy can't manage people this guy is too intimidated by everyone but you, that's your leadership style so how then should we live you know that when you go to china korea or even japan you need to think of who to shake hands with first as you walk into a room when you go to china or korea you need to think of who do i shake hands with first when i walk into a room right you can't just go and just shake hands with this person but then that one is actually the leader the guys might be offended and guys as we do business cross-culturally as we plant churches in other nations we must be aware of these things because there's no harm in doing so you can't just go and say ah you are all equal so i'll just do my own thing you might not reach those people with the gospel and it might be a cultural barrier can you see why we need to be culturally agile amen when I do, when I do um, these guys' wedding later on in the year, when I go and do it, KZN and so on, I'll ask them first of all, I'll say, guys, in the premarital counseling process, I'll say, Cindy, so is there anything I need to know culturally, like about the Zulu people? Like, you know, I want to make sure, like, I really honor your dad and I really, you know, make, what do I do? I'll know with quietly side of the family, it'll be relaxed and, you know, it's all good, it's all good, it's all good. But I'll need to find out, what do I do with, the, with, with uh, your Zulu relatives? Is there someone I need to honor? Does that make sense? And how do I show that particular honor? As long as it doesn't violate my biblical principles. Okay? There was a Mexican manager and he was surprised because he was working in Holland and he had a subordinate of his. And he said to the subordinate, you know what? I would like to have lunch with you. Come, let's go for lunch. And this subordinate said to the Mexican manager, this is in Holland, he says, oh, no, 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 I'll, I've got lunch, a lunch appointment with, with your boss, basically his boss's boss. And this guy was surprised that he's having a lunch appointment with, he's got lunch with my boss, but I didn't even know about it. Why? Because in Holland, it's quite egalitarian. 
It's like, cool, you can have lunch with the CEO, lunch with whoever. But when you work for certain organizations, you have to know, mm, you know what, before I do this, let me make sure this person knows. Amen? Because they think differently culturally. Do you know that in some of these egalitarian countries and so on, you have to be careful who you CC. Because if you send something to someone and then you CC their boss, they can see it as, what is the point of CCing him? He doesn't have to know everything. Am I in trouble or something? But in cultures that are top-down and hierarchical, you better be CCing the boss. Can you see why often we mess up, even in our career growth? Because we're not aware of some of these cultural dynamics. Okay? So just think about that. In Scandinavia, Australia, and the Netherlands, you use first names, don't you? People are offended when you call them by their surname, Mr. So-and-so. They're like, oh, don't call me that. And so I had to adjust. When I got married to Trace years ago, I remember her dad said, because initially I was calling him sir, yes sir, or something like that. And he says, you won't call me sir, I'm Ivan. Now if someone hears me calling my father-in-law Ivan, they might think, you're being rude, you're, because you're looking at it from your cultural lens, right? Yeah, imagine calling your, for some of you are like, ee, ee, ee. <laughs> but I'll get in trouble if I try and call him something else. Are you following me? All right? And so let's be culturally agile where we actually find out what is this person called. Do you know that if a guest minister comes and preaches in this church, or if you're preaching at their church, you might, be, you might not be pro-use of titles, but don't go and just call them with their first name, by the first name, oh yeah, yeah, so yeah, because they might be offended. The thing to find out protocol-wise is what are they called in their environment? Are they called bishop so-and-so? Are they called archbishop so-and-so? And you adapt to that and you don't make a big thing of it. You might not like the use of titles, but guess what? For them, that's important and you do that because the goal is to show them honor. Amen. What's difficult is some people struggle. People who know me pastorally and then now in a business setting, I'm doing a talk and they have to introduce me. And they're now like, hey, Paul, hey, I'm going to really have to. Yeah, because I've always known you. Your pastor Paul to me. Hey, now to say Paul, Paul is about to do this. And they really struggle. Why? Because they're not culturally agile. Are you hearing me? I'm called many different things in many different settings and it's all good. Okay. You can't be an, if you're a CEO of an organization, you can't expect guys from Holland now to come in and because you're also an apostle, all of a sudden these guys from Holland you're doing business with are, hey apostle, hey apostle. They're not going to do that. They'll call you Frank if your name is Frank. Get used to it. Amen. Your identity isn't in your title. Amen. All right. Now power distance is very low in countries like Denmark and Austria. Right? And all of this will affect the church culture in various nations. When we do church in Switzerland, for example, we're going to have to adapt in how we do certain things. We're going to have to adapt in terms of timekeeping because the Swiss are very strong when it comes to timekeeping. When you are egalitarian, you can disagree with the boss in front of others. If you're in Austria or Denmark, right, in countries like that. But let me tell you something. If you're in China... You're not going to just be like, no, I, I see it a bit differently. You'll do it one-on-one. -on -one. Okay? I remember there was a particular person I was coaching. There was a particular lady in a financial institution. And she said to me, Paul, you know what? I'm struggling in this organization. It was a quasi-government organization. She says, Paul, from my subordinate to the CFO, there are about seven different levels. But I come from an IT firm where if you want to have a meeting with the CFO, it's easy. You just set it up and the next day or so you've got the meeting. But now I'm in this environment where I want my work to speak for itself and I want to be the one who presents to these people. But unfortunately, it's always my boss's boss's boss maybe who does the presentation and they might not be that clued up as I am, you know, concerning my particular work. So sometimes you find yourself in a very cross-cultural environment where you want to be egalitarian, where the system is not. And it's up to you to do a lot of hard work in terms of being heard. Amen. Some of you can feel me on that and you know what I'm talking about. Okay. Now, in Spain and Italy, in Spain and Italy, 
countries like that, when you compare them with Sweden, all right, you'll find that there's power distance when it comes to who's got all the questions and who's got all the answers. In a hierarchical situation, the boss is under pressure to have all the answers. Countries like Italy, countries like Spain, countries like Nigeria, if you are the pastor, you must have all the answers. That's a lot of pressure, isn't it? There's some people I speak to, pastors, and I say, you know what, you can tell your people that you don't know the answer for that, and it's okay. In egalitarian environments, it's okay to not have all the answers. Some of you are under pressure in your families because you feel like, as the head of my household, I must answer everything that my kids ask. There are times I have to say to my kids, you know what, I'm going to have to do a bit of research on that. And that's okay. That's being honest. That's being real. So what's the biblical balance here when it comes to power distance? What does the word of God say? In the book of Titus, chapter 2, verse 3 to 5, it says, Likewise, teach the older women to be reverent in the way they live not to be slanderers or addicted to much wine, but to teach what is good. They can then urge the younger women to love their husbands and children. So there's a role you have if you're an older woman. There's already that rank, as it were, in the body of Christ, where it's saying older women urge the younger women, speak into their lives. You don't have to have known them for centuries. You see, some people who are too intimidated to mentor other people, they're like, but I don't really know them, but I don't really know them. But here it's saying, urge the younger women. If you're a good example yourself, urge the younger women to do what? To love their husbands and children. How many of you here are younger women and you would love to have older women helping you to love your husbands? I'm seeing hands go up. Raquel's hand is up. Okay, I'll ask Raquel. Okay, how are things with your husband? By faith. <laughs> All right? All right? People want this. To urge the younger women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled and pure, to be busy at home, to be kind, to be subject to their husbands so that no one will malign the word of God. Whose job is that? It's not saying it's the senior pastor's job. It's saying older women mentor and disciple the younger women in these things, in practical living. Amen? I'm not going to ask how many of you are the older women because they're all in denial about, no, 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 I'm still younger, Paul, I'm still younger, okay? We need to have a church culture that does this. If you've got kids, if you've got kids who are still at junior school, it behooves you to seek counsel from those who've got older children, children who are now in their teens, children who are now at varsity to say, how did you deal with this life stage? Amen. My kids are still at primary school. It behooves me to go and to seek counsel from those with older children to say, how did you cope at this particular life stage? Amen? I don't know. I might have a role in the church that I play, but there's certain things I haven't experienced yet. Amen? You see, in a healthy culture, we become interdependent. You come to me for certain things, but I come to you for other things. As opposed to, I'm the man of God. I don't need anyone. The Holy Spirit will teach me. That's foolishness. Amen? All right. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 12 says, Don't let anyone, look at the balance here, don't let anyone look down on you because you are young. In other words, in other words, your promotion in the kingdom is not based on your age. So when it comes to mentorship in certain areas, based on your age, your maturity, your life stage, you've got the right to speak into people's lives. But in terms of your spiritual authority, it's not based on your age. 1 Timothy 4 verse 12, don't let anyone look down on you because you are young, but set an example for the believers in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. That was Timothy, he had to do that. In Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 6 to 8, it says, Ah, oh, Lord God, I said, I surely do not know how to speak, for I'm only a child. Some translations say, for I'm but a youth. So here we have Jeremiah rejecting the call of God, as God was calling him, because of his age. Many of us reject God's call on our lives for various reasons. Oh, I've got a business to run, Lord. 
And it, oh Lord, I can't speak. Oh Lord, I've got too many children. And what does God say to him? What does God say to him? But the Lord told me. You have to go by what God tells you, not what the cultural default is. See, the cultural default here was there's a certain age you have to be before you can be a prophet. There's a certain age you have to be before you can be a priest. There's a certain age you have to be before you can speak to older people and preach. That was the cultural default. But God said to him, do not say I'm only a child for to everyone I send you, you must go. So what's the qualification? God has sent me. And all that I command you, you must speak. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you to deliver you, declares the Lord. Isn't that powerful? I think that's so powerful that you can be in a situation where you're rejecting the call because of a cultural default. I'm too female. I'm too male. I'm too young. I'm too old. Based on what? Says who? I'm too white, I'm too black, I'm too Indian, I'm too, yeah, that one, right? Now watch this, watch this. Your age does not qualify or disqualify you from ministry. Your age does not qualify or disqualify you from ministry. Just because you're old, it doesn't qualify you. Amen? Some people will say, yeah, but I can't have these youngsters telling me this. Maybe you don't qualify. You've been alive for many years. You've been existing, but you haven't done the things that qualify you. Amen? Hebrews 13 verse 17 says, Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls. That's quite a responsibility God has given us as church leaders. They're keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account let them do this with joy and not with groaning, for that would be of no advantage to you. Can you see how in scripture you have both? You have both. You've got, hey, you're a youngster, don't let people look down on you because of your age. But then you've also got, hey guys, obey your leaders in the Lord. Hey, older women instruct the younger women. And that's why I'm saying to you this morning, be culturally agile, because we see it in the word of God. Now, how much emotion, what, what's the bond like between those in authority and those without? In 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 11 to 13, it says, we have spoken, this is Paul, we have spoken freely to you, Corinthians, and we've opened wide our hearts to you. Now, some of you have been raised in cultures and environments where you can't show emotion. If you are the man, there's no emotion. You know, you know those people who say, no, Paul, we just leave emotions out of this. I'm not talking about emotionalism. I'm talking about being in touch with your emotions. I'm talking about having a bond with your kids where you hug them. Right? John was telling me the other day how he's forcing hugs on his kids and so on, right? Type of thing. Wanting them to be affection affectionate. For some of you, if you weren't raised in that environment, what do you do? It's awkward for you. It's awkward for you and you're distant and your wife is always complaining saying, you must hug the kids. You must wrestle with them. You must. And you're like, eh, I, I can't do that. <laughs> you know why you can't do it? You've placed your cultural values up here higher than the word of God. Because this is what the word of God shows us. Paul, this wonderful, great apostle, he's saying to the Corinthians, we have spoken freely to you, Corinthians, and opened wide our hearts to you. We are not withholding our what? Our affection from you. But you are withholding yours from us. He's making himself vulnerable here. Some of you would never have these conversations with people you're leading. Then he says in verse 13, as a fair exchange, I speak as to my children, open wide your hearts also. Are you open to having that emotional bond with people who you're leading? Are you open to demonstrating affection to your children? Hugging them, kissing them. Sometimes if I give my sons a kiss, they're like, oh dad, come on, that's gross, that's gross. And then I do it on purpose. Hey, dad, come on, you know, dad, please, come on. <laughs> gross according to who? The Bible doesn't say it's gross. 
and one day you will get married to a woman whose primary love language is touch and she wants to be touched so start practicing now with your parents I'm meaning <laughs> amen get used to it all behavior is learned. We learn these things. Those of you, how many of you grew up in families where you would see your mom and dad being affectionate? Right? Kissing, hugging. You'd see that, right? Right. Many of you did. So it's normal. Now some of you are struggling because your spouse wants to hold your hand and you're out in public and so on and you feel embarrassed. Or they want to give you a kiss and you associate a kiss with sex. Church has gone very quiet. I'm obviously <laughs> scratching where it's itching. Just get used to it. Get comfortable. Some of us learned these things when we got married. It's learned behavior. Amen? So there was an emotional bond. Some of you say, but was Jesus affectionate? John 13 verse 23. One of his disciples, the one Jesus loved, was reclining close beside Jesus. It wasn't like Jesus was sitting on a throne over there and then John was way out here. And by the way, John is the one talking about, yeah, anyway, right? <laughs> I just find it interesting that he says that one of his disciples, the one Jesus loved, was reclining close beside Jesus. In fact, some translations actually say, had his head on Jesus' chest. These guys were affectionate toward each other. Jordan is like, yo, <laughs> that's a bit much, yo. Okay. He was just chilling with them. He was chilling with them. I'm going to come and hug you afterwards. I'm going to give you a nice squeeze. <laughs> All right? Now, now watch this. The same John, the same John who could recline with Jesus, chill with Jesus. Are we saying he didn't honor Jesus? Watch this. Because in the book of the Revelation, chapter 1, verse 12 to 13, Look what he says. He says, I turned around to see the voice that was speaking to me. And when I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And he's describing everything that he saw. Verse 14, the hair on his head was white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were like blazing fire. His feet were like bronze, glowing in a furnace. And his voice was like the sound of rushing waters. Right? He continues. Verse 17, when I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. The same John that could lie on Jesus' chest and be like, I'm chilling with Jesus, my boy. Right? Is the same John who sees Jesus in the book of the Revelation and he falls down and he worships. You see, the biblical balance is to be able to respect and honor whilst at the same time be intimate and close. Amen. Is your respect and honor for authority figures causing you to distance yourself from them so that you never actually benefit? Or are you on the other extreme where you've become familiar? You know what I mean by familiar? You become familiar with authority that you cannot receive what that authority figure carries in them. You only receive that which you appreciate and that which you honor. Can I say that again? You'll only receive that which you appreciate and that which you honor. That's why Jesus said that they could not do, he could not do many miracles. Well, when, in the account, he says Jesus could not do many miracles in his own hometown. Why? Their unbelief. And you see that the root of the unbelief was they were familiar with Jesus. They're like, but don't we know his parents? Don't we know his brothers? It's almost like you're disqualified from being respected by people because they know where you come from. They know where your house is. <laughs> Isn't it strange how we are as human beings? In 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 17, it says, the elders who direct the affairs of the church, the elders who direct the affairs of the church, so that affairs of the church aren't directed by everyone. The elders who direct the affairs of the church well are worthy of double honor, especially those whose work is preaching and teaching. Now this is, this is, this is important, isn't it? So ask yourself, what does honor look like when you honor someone? 
Okay? And, and have a mental picture of that. So what is double honor? It says the elders who direct the affairs of the church well are worthy of double honor, especially those whose work is preaching and teaching. But doesn't say you can't chill with them and you can't be affectionate with them and share your issues with them. Amen? And that's the balance we see in scripture. Number 11. So number 10 was to do with egalitarian versus hierarchical. Is everyone clear on that? All right. Number 11 is confrontation versus avoidance. There are certain cultures that are very strong when it comes to confrontation. They'll just tell you what they think. Right? And there are other cultures that are very avoidant when they've got issues. What is the biblical balance? That's my goal, to show you the biblical balance so that we don't judge people when we see how they are and we realize, wait a minute, it's because of how this person was raised. So in high confrontation cultures, disagreement is actually seen as positive for a team positive for a church you can have unfiltered conflict around ideas where we debate things where people come to me after and say yeah but pastor that particular verse yeah but i didn't understand how do you and they respectfully do so and there are no issues but in other cultures that would never happen our man of god said this you cannot question it the bible actually praises the people from berea it says because what they did was they went to the word of god and they studied it to see if what the apostles were saying was actually true from the word of god i encourage you everything that is preached from here you must study the word for yourself amen and make sure you have the revelation yourself instead of just blindly saying i'm just doing it because our pastor said so i'm just doing it because our pastor said so so if your pastor says, go jump off a cliff, are you going to go jump off cliff? Cliff, that's how cults start. Amen? So the word of God is higher than what anyone says, any preacher says. And that's our place of safety. But if you don't know how to interpret the word of God, don't come and start now arguing with me when you're misinterpreting scripture yourself. Right? First, do a course on biblical research. Right? Um, understanding how do I actually interpret scripture. And then when you have the debate or the dialogue with me, make sure that you've got your ducks in a row and, and come with humility. Humility that says, you know what, pastor, you know, when I read this verse, it says this, but then you said this. Can you give me understanding? Can you give me clarity? That's humility. As opposed to, yeah, no, I disagree with you. Yeah, because what you were saying the other day, pastor, yeah, because you guys, that's pride. And God resists the proud. Amen? Amen. All right. So... Avoidant cultures see disagreement as negative for a team dynamic. Okay? It's also important for us to realize that emotional expressiveness isn't the same as readiness to confront. So people in Peru, you all know the country Peru? Right? Remember we had a guy from Peru the other day? Right? People from Peru, right, they're emotionally expressive, but doesn't mean that they're ready to confront. Right? People from India, are emotionally expressive, but doesn't mean that they'll actually confront you concerning the specific thing. So there's a difference between that, between, between those two things, okay? It's also seen in our politics, have you noticed that? A lot of times people are very emotionally expressive, but they aren't always ready to actually confront on a very specific issue. People don't talk about the elephant in the room all the time. So the high confrontation countries are Israel, Greece, France, they're high confrontation countries. Avoidant countries, examples of these are the Philippines, Japan, and Korea. And that's why sometimes you can be doing business in some of those countries and you just find out, oh, what happened to the deal? Oh, how come it's gone to someone else? And then you realize that the people did not want to actually confront you and actually say to you, oh, this is why we didn't give you the deal. I don't know how many of you have had a tender rejected, but you don't know why it was rejected. I've had it before, where I'm doing work for a particular organization, doing work, work, work. They love me to bits, uh, got good raving reviews and that kind of thing. Then all of a sudden, it kind of like just ends. Sorry, we are not renewing it. But no one actually, and these are people you've coached and related with, eh? But no one actually comes and says to you, oh, it's because of this or it's because of that. Why? They're being avoidant. Amen. They're being avoidant. So what's the biblical balance? When should we confront and when should we avoid? 
Galatians chapter 2, verse 11 to 13. But when Peter came to Antioch, I had to oppose him face to face. This is Paul the Apostle speaking. And he's talking about this great Apostle Peter. And Paul basically says, when Peter came to Antioch, guys, I had to oppose him face to face. So, so was Paul willing to confront? Yes, he was. How many of you know that someone who's willing to confront, you tend to trust that person more? They say what they mean and they mean what they say. They don't speak in riddles. And then he says, for what he did was very wrong. Now, please note, he's not writing in a letter something he hasn't already done with Peter. So he's not talking behind Peter's back. He's basically saying what he had already done openly. So he confronted the person face to face. Then he says, when he first arrived, he ate with the Gentile believers who were not circumcised. But afterwards, when some friends of James came, Peter wouldn't eat with the Gentiles anymore. He was afraid of criticism from these people who insisted on the necessity of circumcision. As a result, other Jewish believers followed Peter's hypocrisy. He calls it what it is, hypocrisy. And even Barnabas, you know, people thought, ah, no, at least he's just dealing with Peter. He goes, and even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. So Paul confronted the situation, okay? So what does it look like when you confront? You're calling out someone and you're talking about the elephant in the room. And it's biblical and it's not just to do with personality. You see, some of you will say, ah, it's those fiery red type people. Yeah, they're the ones who do that. But me, Paul, I'm not that way. Regardless of your personality type, ask yourself, are there certain difficult conversations I should actually engage in? Are there certain things that I'm avoiding? You will do it in your own style, in your own way. But I'm telling you right now, to go to your next level of effectiveness, for a lot of people, this is something that they have to overcome. They have to be willing to confront issues. So we see that Paul did it and he didn't apologize for doing so. And it says that I had to oppose him face to face. In other words, he was compelled to do so. You could see it stemmed from a principle that he actually had. He was actually challenging the fear of man that he was seeing in Peter. So how could he himself be carrying fear of man within himself if he's challenging it in Peter? And there's a way to do so respectfully, isn't there? Now, what's the balance to that? Proverbs 15 verse 18 says, A hot-tempered person stirs up conflict, but the one who is patient calms a quarrel. Can you see that? You can confront something, but do it gently. Proverbs 20 verse 3 says, It is to one's honor to avoid strife, but every fool is quick to quarrel. This means we should pick our battles. We should say to ourselves, is this a battle for me or is it for someone else? There's some people who are heroes and heroes need victims in order to rescue them. And they tend to fight other people's battles. Just be careful if you're like that. Ask yourself, is that battle for me to fight? If it's not for you to fight, then leave it alone. Right? Second Timothy chapter 2 verse 23 to 24 says, Don't have anything to do with foolish and stupid arguments. What Paul was dealing with earlier on, that was not a foolish argument. It was something he had to address. But here it says, don't have anything to do with foolish and stupid arguments because you know they produce quarrels. Verse 24, and the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but must be kind to everyone, able to teach, not resentful. Can we go out from here being that person who picks their battles who's kind to everyone, who's gentle and patient at the same time when they need to confront an issue, they confront it. Can we do that? Because that's the biblical balance that we see regardless of your cultural background. Amen. Okay. Some people don't know when to raise issues. There's some people in the middle of a meeting when their boss is presenting something. I dealt with a case recently where this, this leader was just saying, Paul, this person... I, I don't, don't understand. Like I just cast vision and I just said all sorts of things. And then this person on my team, Paul, just says, yeah, but that's just, that, that's no different from what we were doing before. In front of everyone. How many of you know that that's low emotional intelligence? Right? You have to know when to speak, when to keep quiet. You have to know your place. I 
Look at this, Romans 12, verse 17 to 19. It says, do not repay anyone evil for evil. Carefully consider what is right in the eyes of everybody. See, some people say, I know, but I don't care what you think. I don't care what anyone thinks. But the Bible here says, carefully consider what is right in the eyes of everybody. If it is possible on your part, live at peace with everyone. Do not avenge yourselves, beloved. You know, often when people scream and shout and they're quarrelsome, often they're taking revenge. Often it's their way of punishing people. I know, I'll just, I'll just cut them down to size one day. Right? And they do that. Do not avenge yourselves, beloved, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. So we actually do a lot of things as an act of revenge. There's a way we punish our spouses. There's a way we punish people around us, our boss. Sometimes with our bosses, we punish them by procrastinating. So our boss says, I want you to do this. And then we take our time. We go on a personal go slow. You know when people go on a personal go slow? And we procrastinate, but it's the way off. It's a way off punishing them. Ah, they didn't do it when I asked them last time. So I'm going to take my time about my stuff. I'm going to ask you with your spouse. How quick are you to honor them when they say, can you do this for me, please? How ready are you to do that? Or do you drag your feet? And if you drag your feet, is there some resentment that's causing that? Just think about it, okay? Bible says, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. And then finally, number 12, masculine versus feminine. How many of you know that there are certain cultures that are quite masculine and there are some cultures that are quite feminine? Right? You'll find that with a lot of the feminine cultures in the world, when it comes to roles, what men can do and what women should do, right? they're not as set, they're not as fixed. If a guy wants to be a nurse, he can be a nurse. Right? If a guy wants to stay at home and do various things, he can do that. Right? They're not as rigid. Yet we know many of us come from cultures that are very rigid in terms of the man should do this, the woman should do this. How many of you know that if you get married to someone who's from a different cultural background with regards to these types of roles, you'll have issues, won't you? I know certain guys who are so particular about certain things and I'm like thinking, huh? I was speaking to one lady um, who's, I think, in her 40s and um, she was saying, but when I have a guy, she's a single mom, she was saying he must be able to do the basics. Paul, he must be able to do the basics. He must actually be able to make like, you know, a sandwich or something, you know. I can't get married to a guy who can't do that. Now, there's some guys who can't do that. They come from cultural backgrounds where they're like, no, my wife must feed me. No, no, I can't have the helper doing that. It must be from her. She must be the one. Those of you who are like that, where does that come from? Are you afraid that someone will poison you? What is it? I'm just being honest. It must be my, my wife must be the one that cooks me. And then when she doesn't, you've got issues. I know someone, I think she's now, she's a COO of a particular bank. She's in her mid-40s. And she said, you know what, Paul, I'm a good cook. But standing in front of the stove for an hour each evening isn't actually the best use of my time. It's actually my time with my, my daughters, doing homework with them. From 4.30 to 8, that's my time with my daughters. Paul, I can tell you all about World War II. I can tell you all about this. I can tell you all about that. I'm just saying to you, you can have your own family practice in terms of what you like. And a lot of us, we appreciate, even if it's just once a week, that meal our spouse cooks for us and so on. But just be very careful when you become so insistent on certain things. Because that's when you'll fight. And you'll have your wife saying to you, but I work too. And I had to work late hours and now come home and cook and I'm drained. And then now you want, are there kids here? And then now you want to be intimate. Let me just say that with me. But I'm drained and I'm tired because you want me to have to do this, 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 this. Let's be careful. It's causing problems in marriages today. How many of you are feeling me on this? I'm hearing the sisters all saying, amen. Go there. All right? But at the same time, if there's a preference you have, even if it's because of your cultural upbringing, you need to be honest about it say honey I'll try and be patient concerning this but this is just how I was brought up and it really means a lot to me when this happens it's not a law the Bible doesn't say you must but I really like it that's how you appeal not by commanding your spouse amen this is where you just look straight because if you start nudging your spouse or 
yeah. <laughs> then we will know. All right? So masculine cultures are very competitive and they tend to focus on achievement. The culture is assertive. It's egotistical and it's dominant. So countries with masculine cultures, Hungary, Austria, the US, Mexico, Japan, Italy, okay? They value wealth and material success. Feminine cultures tend to focus on caring and quality of life. Now, have you noticed that sometimes we're different even in terms of each individual family that's represented here? Some of you, your families are very egotistical and it's all about success, achievement, goals. And some of you, it's just about quality of life. Let's just chill. Think about it. All right? What culture do you want in your home? So in general terms, masculine cultures are about ego and feminine cultures are about relationships. You see how this affects our marriages. So what's the biblical balance? Number one, scripturally, contentment is crucial. It's important to be content, guys. Life is not all just about goal achievement. It's important to be content. I've got a friend who about five years ago, he turned 40. And he said, you know what? People gave me many presents for my birthday. But there's a gift that I got from God. And guess what that gift was, he said? The gift of contentment. And some of you, you need that. Just being content. Now watch this. Look at the scripture. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 7 to 9. For we brought nothing into the world, and neither can we carry anything out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we'll be content with these. I was, I was thinking about it, eh? Because, you, you know, you st something about it. I was thinking, okay, right now, these are the things we're thinking of in our life. These are our plans. This is what we want to acquire, and so on. And then you read the word, and it says, if we have food and clothing, we'll be content with these. How many of you don't have food? I don't think you would raise your hand right now, hey? You'd feel like, hey, hey, right? How many of you, well, everyone here, clearly you've got clothing, right? <laughs> All right. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with these. Those who want to be rich, however, fall into temptation and become ensnared by many foolish and harmful desires that plunge them into ruin and destruction. We want to be successful. I teach a lot on success. Success is basically goal attainment, but it must always be balanced with contentment. Maybe it's time for us to pray for the gift of contentment. Contentment. Amen. Relationship is key. In John 13 verse 35 it says, By this everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. The mark of being a true disciple is loving one another. Now, how do we balance this with scripture? Jesus wants us to perform great works. He wants us to be content, but he also wants us to achieve greatness. In John 14 verse 12, he says, Very truly I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I've been doing. And they will even do greater things than these because I'm going to the Father. He wants us to do great works. Amen. Imagine hearing that today where Jesus comes to you and says, these great works you guys are admiring me about, you will do greater. He wants us to do the greater works, but from a place of contentment. In Matthew 25, verse 24 to 30, he also who had received the one talent came forward saying, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you scattered no seed. So I was afraid and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here you have what is yours. But his master answered him, you wicked and slothful servant, you knew that I reap where I have not sown and gather where I scattered no seed. Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers. And at my coming, I should have received what was my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to him who has ten talents. For to everyone who has, will be given, more will be given. And he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. And cast the worthless servant into outer darkness. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. 
So God wants us to be faithful stewards of our talents, but from a place of contentment. So my question to you is, are you all success and no relationship? Or on the other hand, are you all relationship and no success? Be faithful with your talents whilst your identity is in Christ. And whatever you do, do it relationally. Amen. Let's pray.